Cyberpunk Uncensored. Hey, what's up, Chumbas? Welcome to my Cyberpunk Red Ultimate Combat Crash Course. So check it out. As you've seen, I'm releasing these little 10 minute or less easily digestible tutorial videos about the different mechanics of that are within Cyberpunk Red. And what I've done here is I grabbed all the combat videos of those tutorials and combined them into this Ultimate Crash Course. And you'll be able to see the timestamps in the description so you can skip around to the sections that interest you the most or you need help with the most. Other than that, definitely check out the little video versions of all of these that I have separate so you can just get what you need to the point. Um, before we get into this, I do want to make a, a few other points and reiterate some things just to kind of drive it home before we get into it. So let's do that first. Um, Dropping or stowing a weapon. I do mention how you can just drop a weapon, drop a body that you're using as a shield or whatever, and it doesn't cost an action in combat, okay? But if you want to stow a weapon, you want to put it in a holster and not just drop it, or put an item somewhere, not just drop it or whatever, it does take an action. So definitely, if you're in the heat of combat, it's much better just to drop the weapon, drop the item, you know, grab the next one, keep doing what you got to do, and then once you're in the clear and things are safe and calm, pick up your weapons and get them, you know what I mean? Otherwise, it's going to take an action to properly, you know, stow that weapon or put it away or that item or whatever. Um, the next thing is, and I mentioned this a couple times, but I want to reiterate it and really drive it home, is anytime you do an aimed shot, it's going to be a rate of fire of one. So even if you're using a melee attack that typically has a rate of fire of two, or you're using a ranged weapon that has a rate of fire of two, if you're doing an aimed shot, it's a rate of fire of one, okay? Uh, the next thing Anytime you're grabbing someone or an item from somebody, it's going to be your dexterity stat plus your brawling skill plus 1d10 versus the opponent's dexterity stat plus their brawling skill plus 1d10. It's always brawling versus brawling when you're trying to grab someone or grab an item from them. Okay? So keep that in mind because, you know, when you do melee attacks or uh, ranged attacks against someone that maybe has a reflex evade or higher, they can choose to evade those bullets. Or, or like I said, anytime you do a melee attack, it's versus the opponent's evade skill because they're trying to evade the hit. But when it comes to grabbing something or someone, uh, you know, grappling them up, it's going to be brawling versus brawling. So just remember that. Uh, ranged weapons, I did not include the chart for all the ranged weapons because it's so simple to understand. It lists the weapon, uh, you know, how many bullets are in the clip, rate of fire, uh, what the damage is, the cost of the weapon. Super simple. You'll see it in the Cyberpunk Red book. Uh, when it com comes time to deal damage on a successful uh, attack, uh, check out that chart. It'll tell you, how, you know, what weapon does what damage. Speaking of damage, I want to mention the critical injury table. Anytime that you, you deal damage, anytime you deal damage, if you roll two sixes, uh, that's whether melee or ranged or whatever. If you roll two sixes, you then go and roll from the critical injury table. And that can be brutal because on the critical injury table, um, there's stuff like, you know, losing an eye, a collapsed lung, losing a leg. It's, it's rough. Uh, and on top of that, you get an extra five points of damage. So like if, if you're shooting someone or hitting someone with a melee attack and you're dealing the damage, right, and you roll two sixes, they take all that damage. Plus, because you rolled two sixes, you go and you roll on the critical injury table. They automatically get an extra five points of damage plus whatever critical injury you rolled on. And like I said, that could be losing an eye or a leg or something. It's, it's rough. Um, the last thing is at one point in one of these videos, I'm pretty sure I said vehicles instead of videos. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure I did. If you see it, let me know in the comments. I'm curious if you can catch it. Um, other than that, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors, Sirenscape, Elderwood Academy, Lion Banner Games, uh, Dice, uh, uh, Level Up Dice, and uh, Cyber Fight Clothing. In fact, this is a Cyber Fight Clothing shirt right here. I love it. Um, and yeah, if you go to the cyberpunkuncensored.com website, you'll see the partners page and you can get discounts and all kinds of cool stuff. So check that out too. Just check out all the links in the description. Um, so yeah, let's get into the, uh, the ultimate combat crash course for Cyberpunk Red. Thanks so much for joining me. Check it all out. Make sure you like and share the video and subscribe so you don't miss any other videos and, and tutorials and things that we're releasing here. Thanks so much. Take care. Hey, what's up, everybody? This video is all about combat in Cyberpunk Red and the actions you can take. 
So let's get right into it. The first thing you need to know is when combat starts, everybody rolls initiative. Initiative is your reflex stat plus 1d10. And that basically tells everyone uh, when they can take their actions, right? So it puts everyone in a queue from highest to lowest, and that's the order in which the characters take their turn. Now, if somebody rolls a tie, uh, if you know if it comes up a tie for a couple of characters, they just roll again to see who gets highest and you know goes first. So that's basically what initiative is. And like I said, everybody that tells the order of turn. And what a turn is is basically your move action plus one other action. So every character, uh, when it's their turn, gets to do one move action and then one other action. So let's get into exactly what those options are and how they work. Um, in Cyberpunk Red, there's a chart and you can read all the details on how it works and you know check out the other pages where you know it elaborates on the details. But, um, but for the sake of this video, on uh, this crash course, I'm just gonna go over the chart briefly on each action and kind of explain how it works. And, and you know, like I've been doing in all these crash course videos, just trying to be short and sweet and to the point. So let's do it. Um, the first thing, like I said before, everybody gets a move action. Your move action is basically you get to move your move stat times two in meters or uh, your move stat in number of squares on a map because in Cyberpunk Red, they suggest when you use a map, each one inch square on the map on the grid equals two meters. So that's how move works. Um, you can the, Another action you can take is an attack. Um, so basically you can make a melee or a ranged attack. And the way that those work are, uh, you know, your melee is basically going to be your dexterity plus your melee skill plus 1d10 versus your opponent's dexterity plus evasion skill uh, plus 1d10. Um, you know, unless you're uh, in some cases, you might be rolling against a DV, like if you're doing a certain, you know, aimed uh, attack at like a parked vehicle or item or, or things like that. But I go into details on that in a separate video uh, where I cover melee and, um, you know, brawling and martial arts. So you can check that out to get into detail. With ranged attacks, it's going to be your reflex plus your ranged skill, whether it's a shoulder, arms, or handgun, etc., uh, plus 1d10 versus a DV, uh, which is you're going to get from a chart that tells you based on distance. And I go over that in the ranged attack uh, video. But it, it, in some cases, if you're uh, who you're attacking or shooting at with your ranged attack, if they have a reflex of eight or higher, they can choose to try to evade that shot, in which case you're not rolling that uh, versus a DV on that chart. You're going to roll that versus, you know, a contested roll. Uh, your opponent is basically going to roll their uh, dexterity plus their evasion plus 1d10. But that's only if they have a reflex of eight or higher. Okay, so, and like I said, I know I'm, I just am going over these little details kind of quick. Um, I elaborate on that in those separate videos. Um, so you can check those out if you want to really drive those uh, mechanics home, you know, and, and remember exactly how all that works. Um, the next thing, the next option that you have is to choke someone. So you can choke someone that you already have grabbed. And, you know, that, that's a separate action. I'll go over that in a minute. But um, if, you, if you grapple somebody, if you grab somebody, which is basically your brawling, it's going to be your, um, you know, dexterity plus your brawling skill plus 1d10 versus your opponent's uh, uh, dexterity plus evasion plus 1d10, or sorry, uh, dexterity plus brawling plus 1d10. It's contested when you're trying to grapple someone. If you do grab them and you're successful, you can use your next action to choke them. And that basically takes your, uh, uh, the damage is basically your body stat from their HP directly from their, you know, to their HP. So whatever your body set is, they, they, the person you choke has to deduct that from their uh, HP directly. No, no armor, you know, no SP stopping power of the armor can stop a choke. And if you do that three times successfully, three, uh, three turns in a row, three actions, you know, you successfully choke them three times in a row, um, they go unconscious. Or if you choke them and do enough damage that it drops their HP below one, uh, they don't die, they go unconscious. Um, but I go over details, you know, those details in that video where I go over brawling and I, I discuss how grappling works because that's the skill it uses. Um, the next option is equip or drop a shield. Now that's a regular shield um, and it does take an action to drop that. Um, I am making a separate video about armor, but just to let you know, shields, it's, it, it doesn't work like armor. Um, in the sense of like stopping power and SP that gets ablated with damage. It just has a flat HP. So that's how shields work. And then once that's reduced down to nothing, it's destroyed. Um, but in order to equip a shield or drop a shield, it does take an action. 
Um, you can get into a vehicle. That's an option. Um, and I go over vehicle combat in a separate video, and that's uh, you know more details, but that does take an action to basically get into a vehicle. It takes an action to get up. That's the next thing you can do. So if someone has you know thrown you or you've fallen or somehow you've ended up prone, in order to get up off the ground, it's going to take an action. Unless you have a martial art. If you do have martial arts, uh, any of the martial arts skills, there's four different ones, and I go over that in that uh, melee martial arts brawling video. But um, if you do have a martial arts, you don't uh, you don't need to take an action to get up. You can actually um, try to roll your martial arts skill plus your uh, dexterity plus one d10 versus a dv of 13. And if you beat that, then you can get up and it doesn't take an action. So remember that if you have martial arts. Um, the next thing is grab, and that's when I was I was already explaining how to grab someone. That's your brawling skill. But um, don't forget, it's not just grabbing somebody. You can also grab an item out of their hand. Um, but that does take an action uh, to grab somebody, and that's what the brawling skill. Um, hold action. This is a little a, a little different. You're not just holding your action. So if it's your turn in, in the initiative, in that order, in that queue, um, you're not just holding your turn like, oh, I'm going to go later, uh, let everybody else go, because you're thinking about it. You have to explain why you're holding that turn. So you have to announce kind of like what's triggering your action later in the queue or, you know, what, what you're going to do later. So it might be something along the lines of, yeah, I don't want to take my action now. I'm going to wait until my teammate, you know, throws that grenade he's going to do during his turn. And then I'm going to, you know, open the door for everybody and, and sneak in there so nobody knows we're going or until after, after he throws the grenade or something along those lines. You, you get the point. You have to explain why you're holding your action and when you're going to take that action later in, in the queue, later in the initiative. Um, the next thing is human shield. So you can basically take an action to equip yourself with a human shield, whether you're, you know, grappling somebody, obviously, um, but picking up like a dead body, right? You can basically, you know, use a human as a shield and their HP, just like a regular shield, is basically going to be their body stat of what, what their body stat was when they were alive. And when that's reduced to nothing, uh, you know, they're just disintegrated or not really useful anymore as a shield. But my point here is that that takes an action, basically, to equip a human shield. Now, it doesn't have it listed that it takes an action to drop it. So just like when you drop a weapon or just drop something, it doesn't take an action. You can just drop it to the ground. But, to, but remember, a regular shield, that does take an action to you know, take that off um, because it's just more involved. You're not just holding a dead body that you don't give a shit about. It's, I guess, strapped on like a shield or you're putting your arm through it or holding it, you know. So that's why they have that listed like that. Um, and that's that's me assuming that um, in the book you can read the details and kind of figure it out yourself. But that's, that's how this chart reads to me. Um, the next action that you can take is a reload. Um, so it'll take a full action basically to reload your gun if you're going to drop in a new clip or whatever. Um, the next thing is run. So keep in mind that you do have a move action, but you can run two times that movement stat if you use your other action as a, as a movement to run. So follow me here. You use your movement, but if you're not going to do another action, one of these other actions I said, you can basically run. So it's doubling up on that move stat that you have. That can be very useful. Um, the next thing is start a vehicle. Um, you can use an action. Now remember, it takes an action to get into a vehicle, and then it takes another action to start the vehicle. But the benefit of that, and I go over this in, in the vehicle combat video, is that all of a sudden your move stat is the vehicle's move stat, and you you basically, um, let me make sure I'm getting this right, you move to the top of the initiative. That's what it says, yeah. I just wanted to double check that, because I do make these videos just on one solid flow. I don't edit it. I don't break it up. I speak off the top of my head. Uh, and, um, and you know, I just want to want to double check sometimes and make sure I'm not giving you wrong information. So, um, yeah, so start a vehicle. The next action that you can take is stabilize. So that's if you're going to, like, you know, give first aid to yourself or somebody else or like a med tech might or get somebody out of the mortally wounded state, you know. Um, so that does take an action to stabilize some, some, someone so they can start the healing process. Um, the next action you can take is throw. So if you're grappling someone and, and you're holding them, you're grabbing someone, you can throw them, in which case uh, you're going to do your body stat directly to their HP, their hit points. Armor doesn't stop it. The stopping power uh, of their armor isn't going to stop it. It also doesn't ablate the armor because that's it doesn't even take that into account. But um, when you throw them, they take that damage and they go prone. So that's pretty awesome. 
something to remember. And that also reminds me about the armor too, about um, uh, ablate, ablating it. Choking doesn't ablate that as well. And then also remember when it comes to, uh, you know, melee and ranged attacks, I, I want to mention that too, like during the attack, even though I go over the details in those videos, I do want to mention it, um, that uh, with melee, it's taking that SP in half. So remember that, that's, that, that's a cool little thing to always remember. Um, and brawling does not, if it, you know, martial arts does as well. So, you know, if you're going to punch or kick somebody, use your martial arts if you have it. If you don't have martial arts, you got to use brawling, in which case you're not taking that SP in half. But I go over those details in those videos. I just wanted to just give another quick reminder in this video. Um, the next thing, aside from throw, and remember when you throw someone, they don't just take that HP, they're prone. So then whoever you threw has to use their next action to get up, unless they know martial arts, in which, like I said, they can roll the, their martial arts skill versus that DV of 13 and get it without taking an action. Um, the next thing is use net actions. This is for net runners, and this is dependent on their interface uh, roll ability, how many net actions they get, but they use their action to do their net actions. Um, the next thing is use an object. So if you're not going to do a ranged attack or a melee attack, use your weapon or something that requires a particular skill or whatever, using just an object, you know, that might require a, uh, uh, you know, uh, longer tasks, more actions, or something outside of using the weapons, maybe a, a quick task or something. But regardless, all, all this happens within an action, and it's it's something you can do aside from attacking. And let me just make sure I get this right. Yeah, see, each turn is a three-second increment, so you want to make sure that if it is a longer action or multiple actions over a course, it might take multiple turns, and the GM will let you know. But um, but. Basically, you can use a skill, um, you can use an option, uh, an object, um, and and all all whether you do either one of those, that's basically going to use an action. So keep that in mind. Um, vehicle maneuver, that's the other thing on there. Um, again, I go over vehicle combat and all that in that other vehicle or uh, in that other video where I go over vehicle combat. But um, but that's another thing you can do in your actions. Um, so if you're you use an action to get into a vehicle, you used your action to start the vehicle. Then at that point, you're using the vehicle's movement. And then you're using the vehicles, you know, combat maneuvers and, you know, like sharp turns and 180 or whatever. You'll you'll see that in, in that video, in that section where I go over uh, vehicle combat. But you can use an action at that point to do vehicle maneuvers. So there you go. That's how combat works. It's initiative. And then that puts you in order. And then every player, basically every character gets to do a move action and a regular action. And this is the chart of basic combat actions. Hey, what's up everybody? This video is all about ranged attacks. So let's get right into it. Let's say you've entered combat, you've already rolled initiative, it's your turn, you've already used your move action and then you used your action to do a ranged attack. This is how you resolve that. It's basically going to be your reflex stat plus your relevant weapon skill, whether it's shoulder arms or handgun or even archery, um, plus a 1d10 versus the defender's DV, which is determined by the range to target and the weapon type you're using, un unless um, that target, that person, that opponent uh, has a reflex of eight or higher, in which case they can decide to try to evade that shot. So you're not going to roll against that DV from that, that ranged chart, which I'm going to show you that chart in a minute and go over how that works. Um, instead, you're going to roll, a con you know, it's going to be contested. Um, your opponent, your target, basically, if their reflex is eight or higher, they're going to roll their dexterity stat plus evasion plus 1d10. Uh, so that's how that works. Uh, let's get into the chart and how the chart works. Um, you can see here you have your weapon type listed on the first column, um, whether you're using pistol, submachine gun, shotgun, assault rifle, sniper, uh, bows and crossbow, grenade launcher, rocket launcher, um, you have all, all your ranged weapons there. Whichever one you're using, you go to that, and then you go over based on distance. You'll see the different columns based on 0 to 6 meters, 7 to 12, 13 to 25, and so on. You go down, you line it up, and that tells you your DV, the difficulty value you have to beat in order to, to have a successful attack, to have a successful ranged attack against your target. Um, so that's how the chart works. Now keep in mind, if you're using your ranged attack, uh, to, to use your auto fire skill instead of, you know, regular shoulder arms or handgun or, or archery or whatever. 
um, if you're going to do auto fire, it's a separate chart. You don't use this chart. You use your auto fire chart. Um, and I, I have, uh, I go over that in a separate vi video where I go over auto fire and suppressive fire. But again, you'll see in the Cyberpunk Red rule book, there is, you know, a chart for ranged attacks, which works like I just explained and, and you see right here. Or if you're using auto fire, it's a separate uh chart so make sure you you don't mix those up you use the proper chart um, but that's how ranged attacks work hey what's up everybody this video is all about auto fire and suppressive fire before we get into it let me make sure of one thing though you have to have 10 bullets do you have 10 bullets with auto fire and suppressive fire you need at least 10 bullets in your magazine so make sure of that first and then let's get into it. Okay, so with Cyberpunk Red, you're basically uh, first determining if you are hitting the target. And to hit, you need to uh, check out the DV uh, table that they have. It's just like a ranged attack where you're basically rolling uh, against certain values based on range, except auto fire has its own table as you see here. Um, so what a DV is, it's a difficulty value. So based on range, you're going to have different values that you have to roll higher than. And your roll for auto fire is your reflex stat plus your auto fire skill plus 1d10. And keep in mind that whoever you're attacking, whoever you're shooting at, the enemy, your target, um, if they have a reflex of 8 or higher, they can choose to try to evade that shot in which case you're not rolling against the DV on the table, you're uh, rolling against a contested roll from your target. Um, so if the reflex is 8 or higher, then you're still rolling your reflex plus auto fire uh, plus 1d10, but it's going to be against the enemy's dexterity plus their evasion skill plus 1d10. And they can only try to evade if their uh, reflex is 8 or higher. Um, the idea there is that their reflex is skilled enough or high enough that they can react quick enough, in which case then their dexterity kicks in plus their evasion skill, uh, plus 1d10 to try to evade your auto fire shot. And that's based on, like I said, your reflex stat plus your auto fire skill plus 1d10. Now a couple things to keep in mind here with auto fire is you cannot do targeted shots. Um, so uh, other range attacks, you know, you can target either the head or the legs or an item that they're holding and just take a negative eight mod to your uh, to hit uh, number, your DV. But with auto fire, you, you can't do targeted shots. It's, you know, auto fire is its own thing. So no targeted shots there. Um, aside from that, uh, once you hit, once you know that you hit uh, based on uh, either the DV uh, chart or the enemy's uh, contested roll if their reflex was high enough. Uh, once you know you hit, you roll damage. Now other ranged attacks, the damage is based on the weapon, you know, a submachine gun or a rifle, a handgun, whatever, they all have their different damage rolls. With auto fire, it works a little different. Um, you're basically rolling 2d6 damage, and keep in mind, it's just if you if you roll two sixes, you still go to the uh, critical injury table and you add that to the damage as well. Um, just like other ranged attacks, if you roll two sixes on any of the damage, it's considered a critical injury, in which case you roll on that table. Same with auto fire. So you roll two d6 damage, and then you multiply that number by the number higher than the dv that you made based on your roll. So let me explain that. So whatever you roll. Like let's say you you uh, your reflex plus your auto fire plus your 1d10 comes out to 20, and uh, your to hit number was 15 because it was less than six meters away, and it's on a DV uh, chart because the enemy's reflex is less than eight. They can't contest it by trying to evade. So you know you rolled five points higher than the DV of 15 you had to hit. So you basically take that. And whether you're using a submachine gun or a rifle, each one has its own number. Submachine gun is max of three. Uh, 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 auto uh, assault rifle is max of four. And you'll see that on the chart of weapons. You'll see where it has, um, under the details on that chart of weapons, you'll see submachine as a parentheses uh, with auto fire three. And under assault rifle, it says auto fire four in parentheses. That's where this comes into play. So whatever number you are above that DV to hit number, in this case, like we said, you rolled a 20 versus a 15, so you, you went five points over. You take that 
times the damage, but only a max based on the weapon. So if it's a submachine gun, that's a max of three times that 2D6 you rolled. Or if, if it was an assault rifle and you got five points above that DV, then you would uh, multiply that 2D6 by four. And now keep in mind, if you roll less uh, than that max number, it's just that number. So it's up to four uh, with assault rifle or up to three times with a submachine gun. So if your hit was 15, and your reflex plus your auto fire skill plus your 1d10 only came out to like 17, you're only two points above the 15 to hit number, you would take that 2d6 that you rolled damage times two, and that's the damage that's given. So basically whatever damage you do with that 2d6, it's multiplied by a max of three SM for the SMG, a max of four for the assault rifle, uh, only by you know whatever number above that to hit number that you ended up rolling. And keep in mind, you know, don't forget, like I mentioned earlier, you have to have at least 10 bullets uh, to pull off auto fire. And don't forget, if you roll two sixes, you roll from the critical injury table. And that's pretty much how auto fire works. So now let's move on to suppressive fire, <laughs> which works very similar. Once again, you have to have at least 10 bullets in your magazine. If you don't, you can't do suppressive fire. And suppressive fire isn't really targeting one particular enemy. You're basically just going crazy shooting, um, trying to cause people to have to take cover. And how that works is, as long as you have 10 bullets, you just set that off. Anyone within 25 meters of your sight range that's not under cover, so anybody that's taking you know cover, behind cover, they don't have to worry about this. They're, they're in the clear, they're fine. But anybody that you can see that's not under cover, that's within 25 meters, they have to basically contest your role. <clears throat> and your role is your reflex plus your auto fire skill plus 1d10, just like when you try to do auto fire. But they're going to contest it with their will stat plus their concentration skill plus 1d10. So if they roll their will plus concentration plus 1d10, and it's less than your reflex plus auto fire skill plus 1d10, then they're basically freaked out over the suppressive fire and they have to use their next action, their, their next move action, they have to take cover. So they're stuck having to take cover. And if they can't reach cover within their next move action, then they have to use their run, which is double their movement uh, and takes up their whole movement and full action. Um, and, and again, if even within that run distance, they still can't get to cover they have to get as close as they can. So it's basically, if they fail this, your suppressive fire is forcing them to go for cover, whether they get it or not. That's what they have to spend their movement action doing. So it's pretty cool. It's a way to, you know, uh, and, and, oh, and it covers that 25 meter radius. So just keep that in mind too. It's a great way to, I don't know if you have a group of people bunched up or even you just want to get a couple people that, that are attacking the party. Do that and, and it'll force them to have to take cover. It can kind of break up um, an offense, like say someone's coming at you, you can easily kind of suppress them that way. <clears throat> Hence the name, suppressive fire. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Hopefully, uh, you know, this was helpful to you and it was a little quick crash course on off fire and suppressive fire. Um, like I said, make sure that you have at least 10 bullets to pull off either one of these things. Make sure you refer to the chart with auto fire. Um, it can be contested if the reflex of the target is eight or higher. Don't forget that. Um, don't forget also with auto fire that if you roll two sixes, you're going to the injury uh, table. And that was submachine gun, the max multiplier on that 2d6 damage is three. And with an assault rifle, the max multiplier is four. Okay? All right, you got it. So. Hey, what's up, everybody? This video is all about aimed shots. Let's get right into it. In Cyberpunk Red, there's basically three ways that you can take an aimed shot. Now, no matter which way you take an aimed shot, you're going to take a negative eight to your ability to hit. So whatever you're, you know, if you're using handgun or uh, shoulder arms, if you're, like, you're using a rifle, in which case it'd be your reflex plus shoulder arms plus 1d10, you're going to take a negative eight modifier uh, if it's an aimed shot. But here's how it works. Um, once you take that, and you can do this in melee attacks too, let me add that, but um, once you decide uh, that you want to do an aimed shot, you decide what type of aimed shot. There's three here. Are you aiming for the head? If you're aiming for the head, any damage that gets through the armor is multiplied by two. That can be pretty deadly. 
Um, are you aiming for an item that they're holding? That's an option as well. In which case, even if just one point gets through their armor, um, they, they drop whatever they're holding in their hand and, and you decide. Um, if, and it, it lands in front of them, let me add that. So just keep that in mind that they could take another action to try to pick it up or something along those lines. Um, the third option, are you aiming for their leg? And the advantage there, which is pretty cool, is even if just one point gets through their SP, through their armor, um, it, they have to take the broken leg critical injury which is, you know, uh, uh, it affects their movement and um, they take an extra five points of damage. So check out the crit critical injury table. They get that broken leg uh, critical injury, you know, if they, if they have a leg that's available to break because they might already have broken legs. They did put that in there. I thought that was pretty funny. But if you're aiming for the leg, yeah, even if just one point gets through their armor, they've got a broken leg, you know what I mean? So they're, they're falling prone. They're taking that extra five points, and they, they get the negative modifier. I believe it's like, well, whatever. Check out their critical injury table. Um, that's more detailed into it. But let me add, aside from these three methods, you can also do an aimed shot to like a weak point in a vehicle. And I'm doing a, a whole vehicle uh, combat video. Uh, check out that crash course. You'll learn more. But just to kind of give you an idea, you can do that. Same thing, a negative eight uh, to your ranged attack. Um, and then if any point gets through uh, the SP of the vehicle, and face it, a lot of vehicles really aren't armed. They just have their uh, uh, structural damage points, their SDP. Um, so if it's not armored, this can be really brutal. But if even just one point gets through the armor, if it is armored, um, it's two times the damage. So it's very similar to a headshot. Um, so that's how you target a, a vehicle. And if you're doing a melee attack, um, same thing. However, if it's a stationary vehicle, it's completely different. You can totally attack a weak point and it's just, uh, you have to beat a DV of 13, I believe is, is what it is uh, to hit. Um, so that's pretty cool. But again, uh, I go into more detail on vehicle combat in the vehicle crash course. This is just about aimed attacks. So there you have it. It's pretty simple and easy to understand. Um, just check out that chart in the Cyberpunk Red Book, and hopefully this crash course was a little bit of help as well. So, Hey, what's up, everybody? This video is all about hand-to-hand -hand combat, brawling, martial arts, and melee. I've got my combat specialist shirt on. I'm ready to go. Let's get into it. The first thing we're going to discuss is brawling. So in the jumpstart kit, brawling did not even, you know, do damage or affect anyone if they were wearing armor. In official Cyberpunk Red, it does do damage uh, if it gets through the armor. So that's really cool, um, considering the fact that everyone has brawling. Uh, and that's something else, you know, uh, keep that in mind. Every single uh, character, edge runner, NPC, everybody ha starts off with a brawling of plus two. Um, it's just kind of what you learn on the streets. You know how to, how to at least throw a punch and a kick, so to speak, and some, some other little things that I'm going to get into in a minute. But, um, but yeah, so basically remember that the damage is reduced by the SP, which is the armor, and uh, damage is determined based on your body. Um, so you can see the chart that they have in the Cyberpunk Red book. Um, if your body is four or under, you do 1d6 damage. Five to six is 2d6 damage. Seven to 10, 3d6 damage. And 11 or higher, 4d6 damage. Um, the other thing that you got to keep in mind is if you have a cybernetic arm, um, then you automatically at least do 2d6 damage. So even if your body is like a four or three or two or whatever, you know, below, um, that five to six range, it's still going to do 2d6 damage because it's a cyber arm. So keep that in mind. Um, now with brawling, there's a couple other things that you do. Um, you can, you know, uh, grapple somebody and then you have some options within that. So it's not just punching and kicking. Um, you can also grapple. Um, so that's going to be your dexterity stat plus your brawling skill plus 1d10. And that's just like any brawling. When you throw a punch or a kick or you're trying to grapple somebody um, and, and you know grab them up, it's always going to be your dexterity plus your brawling skill plus 1d10. And that's going to be uh, contested by your opponent's dexterity stat and their evasion skill plus 1d10. 
Um, it's always going to be that with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Whether it's brawling, martial arts, or melee, um, the defender is always going to roll their dexterity stat plus evasion plus 1d10. Um, martial arts has a, a, a little thing to it. I'll, I'll get into that next, and, and you'll see what I'm saying. with the, It has a DV option too. But, um, but anyways, with brawling, once you determine you know who won did did uh the defender or you and if it's on a tie it always goes to the defender but once you do that then you look at your damage chart and you determine the damage now like i said you can also do some other things with brawling if you want to grapple someone and grab them you roll your brawling versus their uh uh, evasion skill and see if they can get out of it um, or actually no with uh, grappling it's brawling versus brawling um, so it's always going to be like contested like they're trying to brawl you out of getting grappled um, so that that's something to remember it's a, you know just a little bit different when it comes to that but if you win that grapple uh, then you de then you decide are you grappling them up in which case wherever you move they have to move and you both get a negative two to any of your actions because you're both grappled up and the person grappled up and you you can't use any weapons that require two hands, even if you have more than two hands. Um, so keep that in mind as well. But you can also grab an item out of them. It's not just grappling them up for all those other things. You can also grab an item out of their hand with this if you win that that grapple uh, contested role. So that's pretty, pretty interesting too. Um, but anyways, let's get back to if you do grapple them and, and you won that, they, they contested and they weren't successful and you grappled them up um, and you didn't decide to just grab an item, you did grapple them up and you've got them. Now you can move around where, wherever you go, you're dragging them with you and they have no move. The only way that they can get out of this is if they contest it again, like on their, they take their next action to try to, uh, you know, contest that brawling role again uh, and try to get out of the grapple. Um, so that's the only thing they can pretty much do. Otherwise, they're taking a negative two to any other ac actions they want to do. They can't use two-handed weapons. So keep all that in mind. But you, as the person that has them grappled, you can move them around anywhere that you want to move them. Um, you can still take actions at that negative two. But the two interesting things that you can do is you can either choke them or you can throw them. And let me explain that because it's really, it's really neat. Um, so if, you're, if you have them in a grapple, you can decide to choke them and you, you use your action to choke them. And that basically gives them uh, your body stat in damage to them. And if you reduce them, you know, below one point or, or you know, reduce it beyond zero, um, instead of death, they just go unconscious. And you can also um, render them unconscious by choking them three times successfully in a row. So that's pretty awesome, too. Um, so just keep that in mind that grapple isn't always just punching and kicking. It's, gra you know, grappling uh, and grabbing someone, brawling. Uh, gr you can also grapple someone and, um, and you know, choke them out. And then you can also throw them. You can use your action to throw them, in which case, they, they again, they take your body stat in damage directly to their HP. It doesn't, you know, armor doesn't stop this. Same like the choke. Armor doesn't stop it. The armor isn't ablated by it. It's just direct damage to the HP. Uh, but you can throw them, which renders them prone. Then they have to use their next action to actually get up. Um, but they also take that body stat uh, to their damage, to their HP. They take that damage. So that's really cool too. Um, so keep that in mind. Brawling, like I said, it's not just punching and kicking. It's also grappling and, uh, you know, grabbing an item. You can choke, you can throw, render them unconscious if you, if you go with that. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's got some depth to it. And everyone starts off with some brawling. So keep that in mind. It's kind of the staple of, uh, of cyberpunk hand-to-hand. -hand. Um, next, let's get into martial arts. So martial arts has three different form or four different forms, um, karate, taekwondo, judo, or aikido. And each one of those has a couple uh, special moves, um, but I'm not going to get into that. They're kind of elaborate and they, they have some prerequisites of when you can use them and how they work and stuff. I'm going to do a separate crash course video on martial arts special moves. So look out for that. But, um, but yeah, look at the damage chart here, okay? It's very similar to brawling, except they don't account for a cybernetic arm you'll see on this chart. And I believe the reason for this is because martial arts takes your ar the defender's armor and cuts it in half. Um, so th that's awesome. Whatever their armor is, uh, you know, divide that by two, you instantly, you know, take away half their armor and then deal your damage. And um, that can be pretty brutal, um, especially... Uh, you know, like I said, martial arts, uh, you know, ignores half of the armor, but also there's some special moves. So martial arts is definitely more, um, I don't know, 
the better thing to use in hand-to-hand -hand, uh, instead of brawling because of the whole armor issue. Um, brawling, you know, you're going to reduce that damage by the defender's armor, whereas uh, martial arts, it's only half. So that's, that's pretty awesome. And then, like I said, you have the special moves, but that'll be a separate video. Um, martial arts attacks are very similar to brawling. It's your dexterity stat plus that forms skill. So whether you have, you know, karate, taekwondo, judo, or aikido, whichever one, whatever that, that skill is, it's going to be your dexterity stat plus that skill plus 1d10 versus, once again, just like I said, in all hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, your defender's dexterity plus their evasion plus 1d10. Um, and sometimes that'll be versus a DV instead of a contested role. But um, like I said, that's that's on certain special moves within those four form types. Each form type of martial arts has two different special moves, and some of them aren't just a contested role. They actually you're going to roll against the DV um, for what it is. But like I said, those are very, th those are more involved. There's more details into it. There's some prerequisites to be able to, to use those special moves. So I'm going to make a, a separate video on that because that's going to require quite a bit to it to explain but um but yeah that's how martial arts works very similar to brawling except for the fact that you cut that that sp in half which is pretty awesome you take that armor down by half um the next thing i want to get into is melee melee is is really interesting to me because they broke down the weapons again you're going to see the price uh thing you know costly premium expensive remember that in the night market video um, I explain that you need to fix her a night market to get beyond premium, uh, just being able to find items or source them or whatever. Um, and sometimes even lower end items you got to source in the time of red. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's GM's discretion. But um, but yeah, melee weapons are broken down into these main types. It's a uh, light melee, medium, heavy, or very heavy. And um, and you can see you know what they kind of are. They give examples. Um, so it's either like you know a combat knife, or maybe uh, a crowbar or baseball bat maybe it's a sword or a spiked bat or in the very heavy uh, you know chainsaw and I love that they put um, helicopter blades I think that's insane could you imagine someone coming at you with helicopter blades um, number of hand number of hands required um, it varies by type um, typically you know you're, you're it's gonna take two with like a chainsaw and things you know like very heavy uh, melee weapons but if you have a body of eight or higher you can you can yield one of those weapons with one hand so keep that in mind that's a pretty cool uh, uh you know little sort of uh, caveat to that or whatever um the damage it's right there in the chart you can see 1d6 all the way up to 4d6 the rate of fire typically with me uh, melee it's a rate of fire of two um, and that's just like martial arts, you know, you're going to get, uh, you know, with, with most hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's a rate of fire of two. But remember, uh, keep this in mind, melee also does aimed attacks. I did a, a, a video on aimed shots, and you'll, you'll uh, check out that video, and I explain in there how that works and how you can aim for things, whether it's a head or a held item or their legs and how that works. But with melee, um, your rate of fire goes down to one with aimed shots. So keep that in mind. Always, always remember that when it comes to aimed uh, shots and aimed melee attacks, um, it's, it goes down to a rate of fire of one. But otherwise, rate of fire of two with melee, so it can be pretty brutal. You know, you can slash them with a sword and slash them again. That's pretty badass. Um, but it, it also explains if it can be concealed. That's the next chart there. Um, and then the last thing, like I already mentioned about cost, and you know, I, I explain uh, how cost works and items in the night market video. But yeah, that's, that's how damage is determined when it comes to melee. And melee resolving that combat is just like martial arts and brawling. Uh, it's going to be your dexterity stat plus your melee skill plus 1d10 versus the defender's dexterity stat plus their evasion skill plus 1d10. So just remember always with hand-to-hand, -hand, whether it's brawling, martial arts, or melee, the defender is always you know, trying to evade. It's always going to be the defender's dexterity plus evasion plus 1d10, unless uh, it's a grapple. If you're trying to grapple so you can eventually choke or throw someone or grapple them up to move them around and wherever you want, that's always going to be contested brawling, brawling. So that's going to be your dexterity stat plus your brawling skill plus 1d10 versus them the same thing, dexterity, brawling, 1d10. So there you have it. There's your hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's how brawling works, melee, and uh, martial arts. Just remember that martial arts and, and melee, um, if I didn't mention it, armor is cut in half. Don't forget, melee is like martial arts. Armor is cut in half. Brawling, you have to take into account the armor. 
Um, but at least it's not like Jumpstart Kit. Um, Jumpstart Kit Brawling wouldn't even do damage if you were wearing armor. At least now you can do damage with Brawling if you don't have martial arts uh, or melee or a melee weapon to use. You know what I mean? So there you have it. That's how it works. Hope hey, what's up, everybody? This video is all about vehicle combat. Now, before I get into the details of how, you know, vehicles work in combat in Cyberpunk Red, I first want to mention that I did not include the chart where it lists all the vehicles. Um, you can see in Cyberpunk Red, they have that chart. It lists, you know, land, sea, uh, air vehicles. It's so easy to understand. I didn't want to have to go over that. It just lists, you know, the name of the vehicle, a description, um, you know, the speed and things, the price, all that sort of stuff. It's so self-explanatory you can look at it and understand it. The one thing I do want to mention about it though, which I thought was pretty awesome, was the fact that they have speed narrative and then speed combat. So it's like narrative, it'll say, oh, it goes 60 miles per hour. But you know, the combat, it'll say that is 20 move. So you get the move stat, so it just makes sense for combat. I thought that was that's very useful. That was clever. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, that being said, that chart is easy to understand. You can look at it and get it. Let's get into the details that I do want to go over. Um, the first thing is SDP. On that chart, you'll see it's, each vehicle has an SDP. That's not to be confused with SP, like armor, like stopping power. SDP actually stands for structural damage points, and it works like HP, like hit points uh, to a person. Each vehicle basically has its SDP, and those points are reduced by the damage it takes all the way down until it reaches zero, in which case it's, that vehicle is considered destroyed. Okay, so that's what SDP is, and that's how that works. And some vehicles might have armor. The ones in the chart are all just regular vehicles. It just has SDP. But the second you get to Badlands or some nomads have, you know, uh, uh, customized a vehicle, you know, some SP is going to come into play. They've probably armored it up or maybe, uh, you know, put some extra metal on the outside or whatever. It's going to have some SP. But, uh, but normal vehicles, and, and for the sake of uh, that chart in this conversation, it's just SDP, the hit points. Um, the next thing I want to go over is aiming. Um, you can definitely do aimed shots at vehicles, uh, like ranged or melee, and it works You know, just like uh, aimed shots. I do a separate video on aimed shots where I get into the details of that, but uh, for the sake of this video, let me explain some of that to you. Um, you're going to get a negative 8 modifier on your aimed shots, and that it, that happens when you do an aimed shot at a vehicle just the same. Um, the, the difference here is if you're doing a melee attack, on a vehicle, if it's moving, you're going to be versus a DV of 13. So it's going to be your, um, you know, your dexterity plus your melee skill uh, plus 1d10 versus a DV 13. Uh, if, the, if the vehicle's not moving, it's an automatic hit. And let me explain aimed shots. Uh, let me mention something that with vehicles, it's considered you're aiming for the weak point. Okay, so that's kind of what, what it is. So when you do an aim shot, you're basically going for the tires or like the gas cap or, um, you know, the engine, something along those lines. And also remember with aim shots, you only get a rate of fire of one. So even if you're using like a, a submachine gun, you know, a, a rifle, submachine gun or something that has a rate of fire of two or like a melee attack, typically you'll, you'll get two melee attacks or rate of fire of two. With an aim shot, you get one. So just don't forget that with an aim shot. But, um, but that's how aim shots work. Uh, with vehicles, uh, if you're doing melee and it's a parked vehicle, there's no reason not to just slash up those tires or gas cap or uh, engine because it's an automatic hit. And damage that gets through the SP is doubled. It's times two. And remember that most vehicles just have an SDP. They don't have, they're not all armored up. Um, so you're automatically going to be doubling damage that you do when you do a, when you're aiming for weak points of a vehicle. So Pretty, pretty incredible. Um, the next thing that I wanted to go over was interface plugs. Um, if you are using interface plugs, you get both your hands free when driving, which can be so useful because you can use a weapon, you can do other things, make calls, you can do whatever with your hands. Um, otherwise, you need to have at least a hand on, on the wheel at all times. And if you remove them, uh, you're considered uh, losing control of the vehicle. And I'll explain how losing control works in just a moment. Um, the next thing uh, that I want to go over is reflex plus your driving skill. If it's greater than nine, then you're good to go. You can you can do basic driving uh, without having to check uh, that that you know do a check against the DV10. 
However, and that also means that then you can use, you know, car maneuvers and combat. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment. And I'm going to show you that chart and how that works. But keep in mind, if your reflex stat plus your driving skill, and it's whatever driving skill, whether it's land vehicle, sea or air, um, your reflex stat plus your driving skill, if, if that ends up being, you know, nine or less, then you can't do all those special maneuvers. You basically, every single turn that you're driving, you have to roll your reflex plus driving skill and make sure that you beat that DV10. Otherwise, you lose control of the vehicle. And when you lose control of a vehicle, um, whether it be you know by messing up that DV10, um, failing against the DV on, on a maneuver, which I'm gonna get into that chart in a moment, um, or taking your hands off the wheel, you know, and you don't have interface plugs, if you lose control, um, it, basically, the GM controls the action at that point of that vehicle. And if you end up, you know, hitting something like, uh, you know, some partial cover or a pedestrian or another vehicle, right? Uh, if, if you hit something, which the GM is in control, um, you're, you're basically getting your ramming. You take ramming damage. And ramming works like this, because keep in mind, you can use ramming as an attack, but also it comes into play if you uh, lose control, which is basically 66 damage if you ram somebody, you know, or a person. And if you lose control, you're basically going to be hitting uh, the, the person or the item or, or uh, I should say partial cover or other vehicle. Um, and that's up to the GM or maybe not. Maybe you lose control and the GM's nice and they just say, you know, you just kind of spin in place and, you know, that was it during that turn. But nine times out of 10, you know, you're going to, like I said, hit a pedestrian or person, you're going to hit some type of like partial cover, another vehicle. And if you do that, um, everyone in the vehicle, everyone involved gets whiplash uh, from the critical injury table. And that's automatic five extra five points of damage to everyone involved. And you get a plus one um, to your uh, death save uh, modifier. Uh, that's horrible. <laughs> so you can see how that could start stacking up too if you keep losing control, uh, it can really mess you up. But, um, but keep in mind that as a pedestrian, you can dodge that ram. You know, if, you, if say you're not in the vehicle losing control or ramming, but you're the person getting rammed or a vehicle loses control and is ramming you, um, you can try to dodge that, which is gonna be your dexterity stat plus your evasion skill plus 1d10 versus a DV of 13. So that's your chance to get out of it. And if you beat that, you can decide to basically be on top of the vehicle. So that also comes into play if you're driving and you hit a pedestrian, right? So if you're driving and you and you hit a pedestrian or you're about to, right? You lose control or you're ramming and they their dexterity plus their evasion plus 1d10 is greater than dv13, all of a sudden they can decide they they jumped on top of your vehicle. So that's crazy. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with ramming or losing control and then ramming something, if, you know, that partial cover or um, other vehicle is reduced to zero uh, SDP or zero, uh, you know, uh, HP, uh, whether it's structural, you know, structural damage to like uh, um, partial cover or whatever, if, if that the vehicle or the cover or whatever you hit is reduced to zero um, it's destroyed, in which case the car can keep moving. It keeps going forward. If it wasn't reduced to zero, the car stops. So it's hitting the vehicle and it's, you know, an abrupt stop if it didn't reduce down to zero and just destroy it and keep going. Now, if you hit a pedestrian, it always keeps going. You know what I mean? Um, a, a pedestrian, even if you hit them down to zero and they die, it's not going to stop. Uh, you know, you're going to keep going. Uh, e even if it doesn't, it, it's not going to stop the vehicle, even if they don't get down to zero and die. But just remember with the pedestrian, they can end up jumping on your vehicle if they beat that DV-13 um, with their, uh, uh, you know, dodge uh, skill. So keep that in mind that that could happen too. But that's basically how that works. And the damage with ramming is 66. So if you're going to ram another vehicle, ram a pedestrian, or, um, you know, or, you know, you lose control of the vehicle and slam into something or another vehicle, um, it's 66 damage. That's rough, and that that goes to that vehicle, your vehicle, and you know pedestrians that are hit. Man, that's rough. And then everyone involved, uh, including the people uh, in the vehicle, maybe they don't get the sixty-six damage if you're in the vehicle, Raymond. But everyone involved uh, involved gets that whiplash uh, critical injury. So that's that's five points of damage right there, plus that one to that death save. Uh, you know, in addition uh, to your death save. So. 
man, it's it's rough. And that's how, you know, vehicle combat works as far as, you know, SDP, aiming, interface plugs, you know, basic driving, ramming, and losing control. But like I said, say you're in control of the vehicle, your reflex and driving skill is greater than nine. At that point, you can pull off some maneuvers in a vehicle. And I want to go over that chart because they, they provide this chart and there's different DVs based on what you do. Um, you'll see in Cyberpunk Red, the chart is based on maneuver, whether it's swerve, sharp turn, emergency stop, bootleg turn. Maybe you're going to jump the vehicle. You're landing an air vehicle. You're doing an aerobatic maneuver with an air vehicle. They all have different DVs, 13 or 17. Um, and you'll see down down the uh, the right side, it'll, it'll list them right there. So that's how that chart works right so in, in your action when you're in a vehicle and you're using the vehicle's move stat at that point because you're driving it right you can take use your action to do a maneuver whether you want to do a sharp turn which you have to beat a db13 with your um you know your stat plus your your driving skill plus 1d10 or if you want to do like an emergency stop you have to beat 13 or maybe a bootleg turn and completely you know hit that emergency brake and spin it around or whatever it's a 17 so you get the point. That's how that chart works. It's pretty easy to understand. Um, that's how vehicle combat works. Hey, well, there you go. That was the ultimate combat crash course for Cyberpunk Red. I hope it was helpful. And like I said before, make sure you check out the links in the description and you subscribe to Cyberpunk Uncensored on both YouTube and Twitch and join our Discord. You know, don't miss a thing. Stay in touch because we're, we're putting out GM tips, crash courses, tutorials, interviews, live gameplay. We're pretty much putting out cyberpunk content almost every single day. So join us. We'd love to see you again. Take care.